started recording yet? So welcome everybody. We're so thrilled you joined us. I'm Gigi Godwin, President and CEO of the Montgomery County Chamber of Commerce. And it is my pleasure to welcome our board of directors, our advisory board, and our guests to uh, enjoy this evening's guest speaker presentation. As a reminder, of course, we will be recording and we will make this recording available after this evening. So uh, Juliet, we've got everybody on board and she'll continue to admit people as we continue on. Today's presentation is called USG 2.0, working together to meet your company's talent needs. And we can't wait to learn more about USG efforts as they together uh, relate to what all of our companies are dealing with right now, which is our workforce needs. Please use the chat box to send us uh, your questions during the presentation. And so I'm gonna get right to it. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce our chamber's immediate past chair and chair of our legislative affairs committee, director of government and community affairs, Montgomery County uh, and federal strategy of suburban hospital, Leslie Ford Weber. Thank you, Gigi. Uh, and welcome everybody. You know, the Chamber's mission is honestly to accelerate the success of our members. And one of the ways that we accelerate your success is to provide the right information at the right time, and especially from the right experts. And that's why we're bringing you this presentation today. Um, in October of 2020, so in the heart of the pandemic and, and the national search for the new director of the universities at Shady Grove successfully concluded uh, with the naming of Dr. Ann Kadamium to that position as the Shady Grove's third executive director. She was appointed to the post by Dr. Jay Perman, who is chancellor of the University System of Maryland, because for those of you who may not know, the universities at Shady Grove uh, or USG, uh, as in the title of the presentation, is a regional higher education center of the University System of Maryland. It is based right here in Montgomery County, and by virtue of that, is one of just two colleges full, sorry, colleges and universities awarding either the bachelor's or the master's degree in Montgomery County. There are programs at USG from nine University System of Maryland universities, but all on one campus. As executive director, Dr. Gadamian also holds the title of Associate Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs for the university system. She has more than 20 years of experience in higher education and is a nationally recognized scholar and author in the areas of inclusive leadership and organizational change. We have had the pleasure of seeing Anne's expertise, even in our, our casual conversations with the board about how to manage change. Um, and that's why, our board just recently, uh, you'll see her being elevated to a position of leadership within the chamber uh, over the next two years. Today, Anne plans to focus her remarks on USG 2.0, um, the institution's first ever strategic plan. So I'm going to highlight now, Anne, why is that not called USG 1.0 if it's your first plan? But 2.0 is going to help shape the future direction of USG, which is Maryland's largest and most comprehensive regional higher education center and an important partner, especially in growing the talent of our Metro Maryland workforce. And I believe you are starting with a brief video from uh, USG, and then we'll have the pleasure of formally welcoming Dr. Ann Kadamian, Executive Director of the Universities at Shady Grove for her presentation. Thank you, Ann. There's a brilliance to this county and to this college campus with nine Maryland universities offering their top undergraduate and graduate degree programs. The universities at Shady Grove is a pioneer in higher education. USG is an experience like no other with a close-knit community, a strong commitment to student success, and degree programs leading to careers with the region's most prominent employers. Are you ready for the universities at Shady Grove? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Gigi. Really appreciate that. It's really great to be with you all. And I, I appreciate this opportunity to, uh, to talk about USG and where we are. I chatted with the Economic Development Committee about a year and a half ago about our strategic plan, but we're moving along. So it's nice to be able to uh, share an update. 
And um, I hope that there's an opportunity soon for um, my colleagues, uh, Jermaine Williams and Monifa McKnight and myself to talk about the things we're doing together, the three institutions as well. So I look forward to that opportunity down the road as well. Um, I'm gonna uh, share my screen. Can I do that? Can I share my slides here? Let's see. Yep, there we go. Okay, can everyone see the, the, the slides? Fantastic. So we're gonna be talking about how we're working together to meet your company's talent needs. The, the theme behind our change here is that the students that we serve and the economy is changing. And so in order to meet these talent needs, it's not just a simple kind of accelerate the pipeline. There's a lot of things that have to happen in order to meet talent demands. And I'm gonna talk about the way we're approaching that at USG. I wanna give you first a visual here of what we call our community of innovation. Uh, as Leslie noted, we are a regional higher education center and we have nine university partners that offer 81 degree programs on our campus. Uh, when students earn a degree from Shady Grove, they earn a degree from one of our home campus partners, not from the universities at Shady Grove. Uh, and we have three of the partners listed here who are not currently offering degree programs at Shady Grove, but we hope to have all 12 um, soon. We like to think of ourselves as a community of innovation for the University System of Maryland. And I'll say more about that as we go along. This is just a brief snapshot of Shady Grove to give give everyone a little bit of an orientation. We are a 20 year old institution. I think that's a startup in higher ed. Higher ed doesn't necessarily move at rapid pace and rapid speed, uh, but in those 20 years plus, we've had over 15,000 students who have earned degrees from programs offered here at USG. We have a transfer graduation rate, students who transfer into Shady Grove. We are a transfer only institution for undergrads. So they get they earn their, their associate's degree from one of our great partners like Montgomery College or Frederick Community College or Howard Community College. And then they come to Shady Grove, transfer in to finish their junior and senior year for their, for their bachelor's degree. We have a 79% uh, graduation rate for our transfer students, which is, if not the best, it is among the best in the University System of Maryland. We're very proud of that. We have about 31 to 3,500 students in any given semester, 2,000 plus undergraduate students, 1,000 plus graduate students. Part of our plan is really accelerating that and growing that number significantly. About 80% of the undergraduate students transfer from a community college, predominantly Montgomery College, and students can save up to $8,000 a year by following our two plus two pathway, um, a, more, a more affordable education beginning with community college and then into USG, where they not only receive financial aid and support from the home institutions, but from Shady Grove as well. Uh, we have about a 56 to 60 percent debt free graduation rate at Shady Grove, and we're hoping to make that 100 percent uh, over the next uh, uh, decade or so. And about 88% of the graduates from Shady Grove are uh, working in the region or attending graduate school in their intended field, uh, which is, I think, really uh, exciting. Just another snapshot, you can see the, the age breakdown, uh, the gender profile, and some of the ethnic diversity among our students. Our student body here is a, is a great representation of Montgomery County's uh, diversity as well. And uh, you know Montgomery County being the fifth most diverse county in in the in the country, uh, our student body reflects that beautiful, uh, incredible diversity as well. Uh, we conducted our first ever strategic plan. That was my marching orders when I took this job. Is and do a strategic plan. So, so we did in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, we we did a year long strategic planning process that engaged hundreds of stakeholders throughout the process. Um, we did it all on Zoom. Uh, but it was a it was a fantastic, uh, really fun process. We had two big goals in that process. One was we wanted a shared vision, not only for our team here at Shady Grove, but for our academic partners, uh, for uh, our board of advisors, for our students, uh, for all of our stakeholders. And the other was um, that we be very, very inclusive in how we do it. And then finally, we made a commitment uh, to the process of ensuring not only that we implement this plan, but we hold ourselves accountable for this plan. So we've spent the last year um, since we passed the plan working on our implementation model. And that's where I'm going to focus a lot of my attention today is how we're doing it and how we're partnering with employers in order to do that. So um, I'm going to highlight this here. This is a, a statement from the University System of Maryland 
strategic plan. This is Vision 2030. And there's a, a line in here that says where the USM's work has been centered on our institutions and on processes, it must instead be centered on our students. And this is, I think everybody in higher ed would say, of course, we're centered on our students. Of course we are. Uh, but this is a really important transition in how we think about the work ahead to meet workforce demands. We need to understand that going from an institutional focus to a student focus means a lot of change. And I'm going to use, if you'll all indulge me for a moment, I'm going to use an example to try to illustrate what this transition means. Again, this is getting to the heart of the workforce challenge. We have to understand how students are changing and we have to understand what it means to lead with a student-centered focus. Um, you know, I'm of a generation, I think most of you are as well, where we'd go to the mall, right? We were mall shoppers. So that means you'd go to the parking lot where you might have to walk a mile to get in. Um, you come in, there's a, there's a big display board that has print about this size, where you can try to read all the names of the stores that are categorized by things like shoes, apparel, um, you know, jewelry, you know, men's clothing, women's clothing, that kind of thing. And in order to find what you need, you have to go on a journey. You have to pass the Verizon booth, the jewelry booth, the food court. You have to check a, a bunch of different stores. You're up and down the escalators. You're past the playground, right? It's an institutional shopping experience to go to the mall. You're living the institution, intentionally so, right? You're, you're experiencing everything at the mall. But nowadays, we can go on Amazon or any online uh, service, find exactly what we want, and it comes to our door, right? And if you work for one of these online services, you wake up every morning saying, how can I solve my customers' problems today? How can I make it easier to be a customer in my company, right? Well, we make students go to the mall for higher education, right? We, we may give them a bus pass to get there. We may give them a food coupon to eat while they're there. We may give them a map to walk around, right? Uh, we may even give them someone to help them walk around, right? but we still create an institutional experience. We still have them go through what could be a very complex and cumbersome institutional experience, especially going from one institution to another. Or we could build a better water slide. We could build a, a more flexible uh, system of higher education that gives students um, a real student-centric approach, something that is designed for their flexibility, for their choices, and the direction they want to go. So I want to highlight that because I think that's an essential piece of how we want to move forward in order, again, to meet this workforce demand. Um, I mentioned a community of innovation earlier. There are some components that we've identified here at Shady Grove of what it means to be a community of innovation. We think it means that you have a shared challenge, and I'll say more about that in a minute, that you have a shared purpose, that you have a shared framework that you're working with, and that there's a shared benefit. In other words, you're not a place where everyone's just coming and testing out a bunch of different ideas. You, you share a challenge, which in our case is, how do we serve the fluid student of today and tomorrow? You have a shared purpose, which is we're gonna build great flexible pathways for greater access and affordability and career readiness. And we have a shared framework, which in our case is a, an intentional partnership between employers and academic institutions in how we do our work. And we're building out that framework um, as we speak. And that results in good knowledge, good information about how to do this better. You can actually measure and assess what you're doing, learn from that, and reinvest in the things that are working and adjust the things that aren't. So it's innovation with a shared challenge, with a shared purpose, and with a common framework as well. So let's talk about that shared challenge. I think what we embraced here at Shady Grove is that challenge is serving the fluid student of today and tomorrow. Now about I don't know, you know, at the start of the strategic planning process, I was listening to my podcast in the morning as I'm walking along, and I'm listening to Angela Ruggiero, an Olympic ice hockey champion, four years, uh, four-time Olympic ice hockey champion, and she's telling her story about going from a competitive, being a competitive athlete to working behind the scenes in the business offices 
especially for women's professional sports. And she was hearing from people saying, why are you working in women's professional support sports? You know, there's only about 4% of the fan population that even cares about women's professional sports. So why are you doing this? And she just thought, this cannot be. Like, I, I don't believe that statistic. So she created the Sports Innovation Lab, which was dedicated to understanding fandom. How do fans behave and how is that behavior changing? And she compared the fan of today to the traditional fan. The traditional fan is a fan that buys season tickets and, um, you know, watches the game every Saturday or Sunday, wears the gear, their kids follow, they're part of a friend group who, you know, follows the games together at the bar, you know, the restaurant or on, at, um, you know, at home. And that's the traditional fan. But what she found is that fandom is changing, that the behavior of fans is changing. Fans watch on multiple social media platforms now. They create their own content. They may follow individual athletes instead of teams. And they're following those athletes, not because they're necessarily the best athlete, but because they represent something or some value that is, a, is of importance to the fan. They're creating their own content, they're participating with virtual reality, and they're gambling and, and participating electronically that way as well. It's a much more fluid fan experience. Well, it's not a leap to say and to understand that the same thing is happening in, in higher education with students. We have a traditional student who may have dreamed to go to a college campus for four years, goes there, you know, lives on campus, eats on campus, sleeps on campus, goes to class on campus, earns their degree there, becomes an alumni, gives back to the campus, right? That's the traditional student. That population of students who are aspiring to that four-year experience or who can aspire to that four-year experience is getting smaller and smaller. In fact, today, 74% of students in all of higher education, including our community college partners and our four-year partners, 74% of students in higher education today have work responsibilities, they have family responsibilities, they're trying to find ways to finance their own education, they may be first in their family to go to college, English may not be the family's first language, right? And our students today are dealing with some of the most severe and challenging mental health issues we've ever encountered meaning that they may not be able to continue um, in a, in a four-year, you know, continuous four-year time. They may need time off. They may need uh, to take their time and break up, break up the studies. This student needs more flexibility. This student experience will be much more fluid. And we are finding this, that students are, are demanding this, right? They want online, in-person, experiential learning. They want to be able to create pathways and degrees that match their interests, that allow them to, to, to build into where their skills are and what, what they'd like to do. They want to be able to stack credentials. They want to be able to work some, go to school some, work some, go to school some, build those together into a degree. That kind of fluidity is our customer. That's our, our future employee. These are the lifelong learners of today and tomorrow. And we, we need to be thinking about everyone as lifelong learners. It's not just students going to school 18 to 24, it's students, it's learners across a, a span, you know, deciding to come back and get a new degree or get a new credential or pivot and try a new career or expand their career opportunities. So this is our common challenge is how do we serve the future, the fluid student of today and tomorrow? And it's also our challenge that, as we all know, the region and the state's workforce needs are changing rapidly. Um, you know, 65% of jobs nationwide recall, require a college degree, um, an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree. And especially in Montgomery County, I've seen numbers up to 70% uh, or more in Montgomery County as well. We have skyrocketing growth in the need for health and life sciences talent in IT and cybersecurity. We have a huge demand for teachers um, all across the state, all across the country, behavioral health professionals and in Montgomery County as well. And there is a growing demand for employees who are career ready as well as research ready, meaning that they're showing up on the door, not only skilled, but they have leadership skills, they have team building skills, they have strong communication skills, um, they, they bring strong knowledge and expertise in diversity, equity, inclusion, um, they have a, a sense of wellness and professional development, right? These kinds of skills are essential. 
And we're also finding that there's an expectation, especially in the life sciences sector, that they've had some experience in research or in a lab or in some type of a research setting as well. So, so changing needs, changing student population. We also have a shared purpose. And our shared purpose is how do we build pathways to support these students? And we talk about the promise at Shady Grove, which is we're not only going to hold ourselves accountable for students finishing their degrees, but we're going to hold ourselves accountable for meaningful employment and sustainable wage careers or businesses that students develop and create and, and build as well. And so the only way we can do that, say more about that in a minute, is in a deep, deep partnership with employers. We need to do that together. It's not something we can do separately. We need to do it systemically and together. Uh, at Shady Grove, we are, you'll see this is our flywheel. We, we adopted Jim Collins flywheel methodology for our strategic planning process. And our flywheel captures the components that Shady Grove is developing um, for our areas of expertise and capacity to add value to our nine academic partners, to our partners in the county so that we can, we can help to build meaningful pathways. And we're also embracing this model in our pathway building efforts, we're calling the four sector model. So planning for pathways along the lines of health and life sciences, public service education and social sciences, the business enterprise and STEM as well. So thinking across those areas as ways to think about our pathways. And when we talk about pathways here at Shady Grove, we're talking about kind of a freeway system with easy on and off ramps. You know, one way you can enter into a pathway is through a transfer process. Another way you can enter into a pathway is through um, early college and, and middle college. Uh, another way you can enter into a pathway is, you know, coming in uh, to, to pivot and to change a career, right? There's, there's all kinds of different ways you can enter into a pathway experience. Pathways should empower student choices. They should give them plenty of information, plenty of support, plenty of opportunity, and should be directly connected to employment opportunities uh, and the academic possibilities of how to get there should also be well aligned and arranged as well. We also have what we're calling our shared framework. And this is what I've referenced earlier, that there should be a deep academic and employer partnership for pathways. We need to be able to, um, oops, sorry, I missed my, yeah, there we go. Um, we need to figure out how employers and business can work together more systematically in order to deliver on the pathway experience. You know, not, not academic institutions saying like, oh yeah, okay, well, we need some internships over here. Or we'll do an MOU over here with this company and not employers saying, when are you gonna get your act together and bring more, you know, bring more employees out here who can, who can do what I need them to do right now, right? The only way we address this is in deep partnership. Now I put this quote here. This is a quote by Shanika Hope, who is the director of Google's Education for Social Impact Team. Google has given Shady Grove um, a gift of $500,000 to take the year to plan some of our measuring and assessment efforts associated with pathway building. She said, building a diverse and highly skilled talent pool is vital to ensuring continued economic growth, and the success of any industry. By measuring and assessing what works best, we hope they, meaning Shady Grove and all of our partners, can continue to model and scale such successful pathways. So Google is investing in this idea of a pathway. And what they're investing in is our, our efforts to do this more systemically in partnership with business as well, and to measure and assess as we go along so that we can understand what works, what doesn't, what's working, what could work better, um, and try to continue to invest in those efforts. You know, for example, uh, you know, growing greater diversity, greater student diversity and opportunities in STEM and leadership in STEM. There's a lot of information now about how we can do this better. Uh, everything from paid internships to mentoring programs to ensuring that teachers look like their students and represent their students uh, to the kind of um, opportunities for leadership development, right? There's, there's a variety of things that as we try these things, we need to measure and assess as we go along. Now, as part of this partnership, I've been reminded of Operation Warp Speed. Remember Operation Warp Speed? <laughs> it wasn't that long ago. It was during COVID. And what stood out for me in Operation Warp Speed was this partnership and this dialogue and the flexibility. It was a commitment to a common goal 
but it was uh, it was a, a, a deep partnership between regulators and government and universities and businesses uh, in the biotech and the life sciences space in order to make this happen. It was the embrace of a, an original structure to make that happen, some agreed upon metrics and a collective impact that didn't sacrifice safety for speed. And so as I think about where we are right now as employers, as academic institutions, as communities, where we have changing needs of our students, we have changing economy, uh, we have uh, you know, incredible equity challenges across our educational system and our, our business system as well. I think we're in a very urgent situation. And I think it's time to try some new things in big ways. And so we tried to map on to Operation Warp Speed what we are doing here as well in terms of delivering on the promise, academic partners and employers working together to plan and build for pathways, a new organizational structure around these four sector models, agreed upon metrics. And doing something together at a greater speed and within a big way that doesn't sacrifice academic quality um, and career readiness as well. Uh, so this is just a visual of this partnership and how we should be thinking about uh, how, we, how we move forward. Um, let me say a little bit about this framework and how we're trying to build it. This is where I think all of you can, you know, where our business community um, plays the biggest role. So I mentioned our four industry sectors. Within Shady Grove, we are standing up hubs within each of those sectors. So a hub where the work of advancing the employer academic partnership uh, takes place, where we integrate career readiness opportunities with academic planning. So students are not only getting educated about you know, how, to, how to be engineers and how to be successful mathematicians and how to be nurses and how to, how to be physical therapists, but they're also getting along with that, their career competencies. At Shady Grove and at Montgomery College and at MCPS, we have consensus across our three institutions about what those career competencies ought to be. There's nine of them. And we have agreement to try to continue to build those into the student experience across their educational journey. So when a student graduates from Montgomery College or graduates from a, an institution here at Shady Grove, they will have encountered and have experience with these uh, career readiness competencies, with, with teamwork, with um, uh, uh, leadership uh, competencies, with communication, with data literacy, uh, with a wide range of competencies that we know employers are saying they need. I can't tell you how many times I've heard uh, people here in the 270 corridor say, you know, I can hire the most brilliant PhD and it still takes me a year and a half to train them to be ready to go in, in the lab and, and to do the work that we need them to do. So the more we can do to prepare students um, to step into the door ready to go, uh, the better off we'll be. These hubs will also foster innovation and collaboration and they'll ensure that work is done through an equity foundation as well. We have, um, we stood up our very first hub a couple of weeks ago, and it's the STEM hub. I won't go through all the details of this, but every hub has uh, co-chairs, a co-chair from our, our executive council and a co-chair from our um, academic partners. We call this the core hub because this group, which has also our team from within USG representing different parts of our flywheel operations, this core group meets more regularly to plan and coordinate with our teams here on the work that has to be done around that. But we also have what we're calling um, the uh, quarterly hub, which meets quarterly, is an expansion of the core hub and includes more of our academic partners, more employers, uh, more of our career readiness uh, leaders and professionals as well. And so this quarterly hub is really a kind of bigger intake system for the, for the data, for the information, for the best practices, for the partnerships uh, that then gets translated into pathway initiatives through the work of the core hub. Um, and you'll see where we, we've listed employers, our board of advisors has been reorganized 
to map onto this industry sector approach. So our board of advisors now has a committee on STEM, a committee on life sciences and health, a committee on public service and education, and a committee on the business enterprise. And so as we recruit and develop members to our board, it will be around these areas. And those committees now have the responsibility of of uh, nurturing and fostering the ecosystem of employment partners around the work that we're doing uh, at Shady Grove. So here's just a visual of what this looks like, um, regular activity and then a quarterly set of activity, all informed by the data that we are gathering and working with our partners on to understand demand, in key areas to understand the academic supply and the talent development in key areas and where the opportunities and the needs are in this path in these pathway efforts as well. So far to date at Shady Grove, I mentioned our board of advisors reorganization. Uh, Kevin Beverly is our board chair and he's done a brilliant job of leading that reorganization effort. We've launched our STEM industry sector hub. We hope to learn a lot from this launch and we'll be launching next our life sciences and health hub, uh, followed by probably public service and, and business as well. The point is to learn from this first launch so that we can try to get it right and emulate some of that as we, as we roll out the other hubs as well. It doesn't mean we're not doing anything in those other areas, but the formal structures are getting stood up um, in a staggered way. We've also held a summit with our nine university partners and key employers and our board of advisors to uh, make sure that we're aligning the degree programs appropriately with the uh, industry sectors. Uh, every academic program here at Shady Grove has a primary sector group, and in some cases, they may have a secondary group. So for example, if you're the, the Smith School, uh, you're in the business sector, but you may also uh, do have specialized programs such as business analytics, which have a STEM component. So you, you would participate in the STEM piece as a secondary partner as well. Um, and we're, we, we're doing early work. We did some work with um, the, the, some of the resources we receive, are receiving from the county, um, working with REACH advisors in order to start laying some of this groundwork around mapping out the demand, map, mapping out the key areas, and looking at where we have the supply. And that will be an important part of, of the, um, the work that we do together. The goal will hope, hopefully be a shared impact and benefit. And by that, we mean there should be uh, the employer partnership with shared commitment to building the workforce, employers investing deeply in how we do this, academic partners investing. Um, it's going to take some time to build, but it will be a systemic change. And I think it will be a unique change uh, here, at least in with within the system, University System of Maryland and how we go about doing this. We hope to activate the power of the University System of Maryland to learn together, to model, and to scale. We have a unique opportunity here with nine partners. We hope to have all 12 soon, you know, that we can do some things together. It shouldn't just be we're a piece of real estate where our partners come. We need to be finding ways to collectively address this challenge of serving the future fluid student and doing so through pathways. And so we hope that that power of having so many um, partners on one campus can be realized. We think it'll have a greater impact for students in terms of access, affordability, and of course, enrollments for our partners. Uh, we see this as a chance to reduce the risk to individual institutions among our, um, our, our USM partners um, and employers to apply these lessons. So if you wanna try something new, you wanna try something innovative in this space of pathway development, let's test it out and do it at Shady Grove. Let's learn from it. And if it works, let's apply it back. I'll, I'll give one quick example, which some of you may be familiar with. There is a, um, a naval research base in San Diego called uh, China Lake. And back in the 80s, the, um, the, their personnel system was quite broken and they had about a 75% vacancy rate um, in terms of research scientists. They couldn't hire people, they couldn't keep them. And so what Reagan was president at the time and he designated that, um, that base as a demonstration project using legislation that uh, Jimmy Carter had passed and gave them like a little bubble, if you will, to try some new things and experiment around performance management. And eventually they got to, you know, over 80% fill rate. 
And the lessons were then captured by the GAO and shared, and eventually the system that they created was made permanent as well. So as a demonstration hub, they were given some permissions to do some creative things to learn, and then those lessons could be applied more broadly across other research centers and labs as well. We want to do the same thing in the University System of Maryland, in the state of Maryland, in terms of some of these higher education innovations that can lead to meeting greater workforce demand. And we want to be able to do that, again, in partnership, not only with our academic institutions, but with employers in the area and the region as well. We want to be able to deliver on a student-centered approach and a fresh return on investment for the fluid student. And we want to be able to develop a shared assessment framework for the work that we're doing as well. So those are my comments, uh, my updates, and I, I would greatly appreciate any kind of feedback or questions or head scratching concerns that, <laughs> that anyone may have. Wow, Anne, thank you so much. That's a, a lot of work to have undertaken. I hope the, um, I'm assuming it was the chancellor who told you that you had to first step and produce a strategic plan that you've been able to check that off your own uh, employee evaluation. <laughs> I, I did see a hand go up and then disappeared. So I'll take a second and ask a question. I was really struck by um, your note about students needing and expecting fluidity and flexibility in their academic work. What words of wisdom do you have for our member companies as the future employer employers about the kind of flexibility and fluidity that these young people might also expect in their future work settings? Leslie, you just nailed it. I mean, we're seeing fluidity in career expectations as well, right? I, I remember taking a job at the University of Wisconsin in 1991 or so, and I thought, I'm going to be here my whole life, you know, like, this is it. Of course, I wasn't. We moved after six years or so, but but the idea of being someplace permanently, it's just, it's, it's a very different kind of approach and experience. So there's already built in some fluidity about, you know, this is a personal career journey. I think I think the, the fluid student is also the fluid employee and is interested in, you know, kind of crafting that personal career journey as well. So there's a lot of, you know, I think, professional development opportunities, um, you know, the ease of coming on board and the ease of leaving and connecting. And, you know, there's embracing that fluidity is going to be key. Um, I also think, you know, we're seeing with a lot of our students as well, there's a much deeper, and we see this in the fluid fan uh, things that I talked about as well, there's a, a much deeper values component to the choices that students are making and then future employee, employees are making. They're interested in what are the commitments of an organization to DEI? What are the commitments to sustainability and climate change? Uh, you know, what is your work-life balance? You know, there, there is a lot to, there's a lot more that's informing choices than might have been in the past as well. So I think employers also need to embrace this fluidity, focusing on, you know, how to support individual career development and opportunity. We've talked about mapping out pathways here at Shady Grove for our employees here at Shady Grove. We should be very clear here about pathways to development and success and opportunity so that you'd, we hired you for this job, but that doesn't mean you'll be in that job forever. Here are some pathways that you can think about where you can go and how you can develop. So creating those opportunities for fluidity within the organization and embracing that and giving people opportunities maybe once a year to um, express an opportunity for, for change and for you know, promotion or a new, a new position. So I think embracing that is going to be key to um, employ, employer success as well with this future. Yeah, that's helpful. It's reminiscent. I had an HR person tell me that she was starting to recruit uh, young people who had grown up playing video games and their expectation was always to level up. And so you needed to find that opportunity within the organization. That just, just always struck with me on that one. Um, questions from anyone. You can use the chat function. You can use the raise hand function. I actually have a question just to get oh, us going. Yeah, Gigi. So mm -hmm. look at, uh, we have so many, uh, you know, different industries represented on this call and in the chamber. And I'm wondering if you're seeing, um, you know, among those students that appreciating the fluidity, the age range of today's student um, in, in higher education that you're encountering here at USG. Uh, and I'm just wondering, do you see differences 
you know, in areas, those that are pursuing IT, biotech uh, versus, you know, construction management or, uh, or, or finance, accounting, banking. I mean, there are lots of different areas. Are you finding, are you seeing more interest in some areas or the students are, depending on what fields they're going into, are either more or less concerned about fluidity? I mean, is there any sort of, are there any like pull downs <laughs> on this topic that you're talking about? Click and pull down for like, okay, this, this is where I really am seeing this as I'm seeing it less so here. I'm just curious in terms of industry areas as opposed to identity areas? Yeah, no, that's a really great question, Gigi. And I don't have really good data on that yet. We will eventually have better data on that by, by industry sector. But, you know, there are some industries that are standing out. IT and biotech are clearly areas where people are moving into or, you know, thinking about how, they, how to grow their career. We're seeing a lot of interest in um, people who have been in the life sciences or the biotechnology space wanting to become leaders or managers and that, that kind of evolution and that kind of change. We're also seeing people, and I know our, our partners with Montgomery College, you know, we've done some, some boot camps together that give people an opportunity to kind of pivot and change to a new career and new, you know, new skill sets as well. I think, you know, something like IT, where the skill sets can change rapidly every five years or so because there's new software and new skill sets. And, you know, so there's always a churn there in terms of people wanting to learn new skill sets and, and, and take on new opportunities. Um, you know, I, so it's hard to say that one industry over another, you know, we're thinking about education, for example, about the, the education pathway and the work of the blueprint. And, you know, the blueprint is very focused on there's two big pillars that stand out for us and for Montgomery College and for MCPS, and that is around career readiness uh, and college readiness, and then also around diversity of staff and teachers and excellence. And so to address both of those requires a very comprehensive pathway thinking. So it's not only about the people who are pursuing an associate's degree and a bachelor's degree and want to go right into teaching, but it's also about the people who are currently paraprofessionals who want to become teachers. And it's about you know, people who have another degree outside of education who want to become a teacher. And it's about people who are currently teachers who want to get a specialization. And it's about people who want to become administrators. And so thinking about that whole pathway, you know, you see, you see people, in, you know, kind of in and out and all around. We saw a big exodus out of teaching, but I think we're going to see, again, a kind of in, influx as well, but, um, you know, from different different perspectives and different angles, people maybe who haven't been teachers who want to become a teacher, for example. So I can't say with any data, Gigi, that there's a particular industry that highlights some of these things, but some, especially in the IT and the biotech spaces, it stands out for some of the fluidity and growth patterns that we're seeing. Thank you. And I see we have a question from Sanjay. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Sanjay. Uh, hi, how are you? Good. Uh, it looks like, you know, when I put my hand up uh, and knew what I'm going to say, <laughs> <laughs> it, it's because we work together, right? So, <laughs> so, so I think uh, certainly great to see you, Gigi, and everyone. Uh, Let's Great to see you too. Uh, you know, the uh, as a state, we have some immediate uh, issues to, to, to address. If you look at healthcare, the massive retirements that are happening. And uh, that's also happening in healthcare space. And we have an aging society. So uh, we need more healthcare workers and our providers, healthcare providers are going to be now healthcare seekers. So the blueprint just in the area of nursing, a uh, blueprint talks about 36,000 nurses in next 10 years our capacity is significantly less, right? So now, you know, as a state, we have to think about how do we look at our, our capacity issue and look at all our institutions and create a system to increase the capacity. We're not going to open 100 colleges because that's not sustainable and that's not the way to go. Same in the teaching space, uh, Blueprint predicts 64,000 or something and would remember uh, in 10 years. Maryland has been importer of teachers, one of the largest importer, uh, importer of teachers in the United States. Uh, I looked at data, I think, uh, few years ago. 
entire state of Maryland produced one high school chemistry teacher. We are knowledge-based economy. Chemistry is so important, right? Mm -hmm. So why are we having that challenge? We will have to come up with innovative solutions, not only from, from curriculum or pathway point of view, other things, salary, what we pay teachers, all those things I think we'll have to think about. And IT right now, in the last three years, I think about 1.3 million uh, unique job posting in DMV region, not just county or, or Maryland. And what we produce is significantly less. So that's already the number challenge. And within that, IT changes very fast. By the time a typical, all of us in higher education, we change curriculum, technology changes. So that rapid change is something that we are dealing with. And IT changes itself, but it changes other areas. Like Montgomery College had a program in polysonography, the sleep uh, center-based sleep testing. Uh, just yesterday, our board approved deletion because there's new technology. You don't need to go to a sleep uh, center-based study. It can be done at home. And so IT is changing everything and uh, certainly the AI and and its impact on everything. Uh, the need for ongoing training, ongoing professional development, ongoing continuing education will be significantly larger than our capacity today. So we have a lot of work to do. And, and I think, uh, you know, thank you to the chamber for bringing us together. And, and this is so important, uh, uh, making sure that we are connected and we are all working together. Yeah, Sanjay, you always have such a great comprehensive understanding of all the challenges. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I think that's the capacity challenge that we are facing. I think the talent is here. The talent is here. The equity, access to institutions, the institutional focus, the cumbersome nature of transfer and all of these things, these are our roadblocks. And we need to be thinking about how we open up these floodgates, how we create more opportunities, how we center the student experience so that we can, people can get a great education, however fluid it may be, and stay here in the state or stay here in the region um, and, and serve. So I also think your point about technology is right on. And the numbers that we're looking at right now for healthcare workers and for nurses, those are based upon kind of existing systems. And I think our systems are going to change a lot in the next couple of years. So um, those numbers may fluctuate, but um, no, I couldn't agree with you more, Sanjay. I think you're absolutely right. It's a, it's a capacity challenge. And um, higher education, education in general, has to figure out how to operate in a much more rapid, flexible way than we currently do. It's like turning the Titanic around for certain things. So we know from our business analytics experience, right, Sanji, how long it takes to, to do these things. So, Well, let's hope that the Titanic was turned instead of sinking. Again. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> speaking of healthcare, uh, our colleague Anise Cody has her hand up. Anise. Hi, Anise. Hi there. Um, thank you. That was terrific. Um, I, I have an observation and a question. The observation is that the thing that I'm excited about the possibilities with USG being here, with Montgomery College being here, is that we don't have to solve this problem for the entire United States. We've got right. a million people. We've got an economy that has a significant number of businesses where there are decision makers right here in this community. And we can act, we can identify where the opportunities are and make changes relatively easily because you're accessible and Jermaine is accessible and the business leaders are accessible. And so I feel like there is opportunity in being not small, but manageable yeah. uh, within this community to really adapt some of the, the work that you're talking about to have a clear pipeline between education and success in a, in a career. So that's my observation. My question is, how can the business community help you? And, and um, what sort of information or feedback or what is it that you need from us to be able to make you more successful in crafting that, um, the, the program that USG can, can feed into the economy? I really appreciate that. I think there's a couple of things that we can do. I, I do think that we waste a lot of energy 
uh, in one-off agreements. So there's, you know, a lot of times a business will come to us and say, we want to do a pathway with you for our business, right? We we live we live uh, here at Shady Grove across the street from a massive biotechnology, you know, millions of square feet here, and they're all interested in a kind of personalized partnership for their company, right? We can't do that. We don't have the bandwidth to do that. So we need some type of consensus around a framework for doing this. Is there something that we can agree to? Is it around the four sectors? Is it around key ways that we engage? And so that's what we're trying to do at Shady Grove is to reduce that decision set, you know, kind of, kind of come to employers with a set of decisions. Look, we've got a four sector model. Here are the ways you can engage in helping to do this. You can help in the planning process. You can help in, in how, you know, what we measure and how we measure it. You can do a very special pilot with us. You can help with the career readiness and help us build pathways into internships, experiential learning. Um, we, you know, so there's a, and you can give scholarships or you can invest in things as well. So rather than going to business and saying, so what would you like? What do you need? You know, businesses are busy. You're running businesses, you know, so coming to them with what, what we need in order to make this work, I think narrows the choice set and could be very helpful in that sense. Doing this around, around sectors could also be helpful. So, you know, from the Shady Grove perspective, we're bringing employers together to get feedback on this, to engage in this process, you know, working with us on some type of a consensus towards some type of a framework for this. MCPS has all of the businesses that they engage with. MC and other community, other colleges have their partners. All of our degree programs all have their own business partners. There's a lot of energy lost in that process. And the more we can do together, I think the better off we'll be. So I think in these, you know, coming together around some consensus points around how we do this, around some frameworks and around some common goals. I also think supporting some common goals that we can set at a, as a county in terms of what we'd like to accomplish. Imagine an accountability summit every single year where we look at some shared common goals in the county that business is invested in, that Shady Grove and, and all of our academic partners are invested in, that, you know, that, that government's invested in, and we hold ourselves accountable for how we're doing on those metrics, you know, degree completion and, you know, matching graduates to meaningful careers and, you know, thinking holistically about that. So I think it's a we, we get a lot of support from the business community. I will say that we, uh, you know, of all the places I've ever lived, I can't imagine a more engaged and supported business community than here in Montgomery County. It's phenomenal. And business owners want to be part of the solution. They want to be part of supporting this incredibly diverse community and make that our diverse workforce as well. So I don't think will is a problem. I think it's really coming together around some common frameworks and how we can do this and some consensus on how we're going to do this. We're going to be bringing business partners together around these hubs to talk about that and figure out what that menu of items ought to be. I think participation in that and, you know, really embracing this effort of a, you know, you said it, Anise, we're, we're a community here. We're, we're a, you know, a manageable space where we can do some great things. You know, let's make some commitments at this level as a county and see where we can go. Well, that's a great note to end on. <laughs> and Anise, thank you for that question. It was so appropriate because, of course, that's why we're all here today is, is to figure out, uh, you know, how we can uh, work together. Because as, after all, that was that was the point of this um, presentation was working together uh, so that we address uh, our workforce needs and, and are able to, to work with USG and our, uh, all of our education partners uh, so that, that we're best able to educate uh, our workforce here and that it, is, it isn't just the 18 to 24 year olds, uh, that model has sailed right. <laughs> into the sunset, right? right? So yeah. we're past that, uh, but, to, but to have a really good dialogue is important uh, that uh, both, you know, so there's input coming from uh, both directions on how to move forward most effectively because uh, the talent issue is not new and it has uh, certainly occupied the attention of this board and every CEO is basically kept up at night. What keeps you up at night? This issue. So I we have to say couldn't be more relevant. This was incredibly helpful. Uh, and, and I want to, on behalf of the chamber, thank you and for uh, an incredible presentation, learned that there's a lot that's happened since the last time we checked in officially on, uh, on what uh, USG is doing. And, and so with that, um, if I may, Madam Chair, 
I, I want to say thank you to our board members and guests that joined us this evening. Uh, your time is valuable and we appreciate that you spent it with us. Uh, and we look forward to you joining us uh, on April 27th for an in-person meeting at the chamber with our guest speaker, Paul Wiedefeld, who we know well and is, uh, the, is now the uh, Maryland uh, Secretary of, of Department of Transportation, MDOT, as it's affectionately known. We know him well from his prior role at Metro. That will be at the chamber. Uh, so I hope everybody's remembered how to get there <laughs> because, because we will be meeting there. We will feed you. And our plan is to make lunch available at one for those that are you know driving around uh, and need to, a little time to network and sort themselves out. The, the board meeting will be from two to three and we will have Paul Wiedefeld from three to four uh, and I'm sure he'll stay a little longer than that. So we're gonna try a midday uh, event and we hope you'll join us for that. And so with that, Madam Chair, and uh, to our great speaker, Dr. Ann Kadimian, and to all that joined us, I wanna say thank you and good night. <laughs>